Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, Radio Online, and of course on your smart speaker. Coming up, the BBC says sorry to the family at the centre of the Hugh Edwards scandal over the way their complaint was handled. It comes after claims a BBC, the BBC paid thousands to a troubled teenager who sent him sexual images. We'll have more on that story coming next. Also, residents of Millam, the Cumbrian town in the grips of a housing crisis, have claimed victory after plans to house asylum seekers in eight rundown properties were shelved by the government following a protest. We'll have more on that shortly. And um, pro-Palestine marches have cost taxpayers more than Get this, £25 million while placing unsustainable burdens on the police, MPs have warned. Is it time for a change in the law to protect the police? And of course, it's your call. The show is all about your responses and your opinions. We're asking this question. Do you have any faith left in the government's immigration policies? Our lines are now open. 0344 499 1000. You can text 87222. We're on the socials at Talk TV. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Divya. Good afternoon. The former sub-postmaster who led a campaign to expose the post office IT scandal has told MPs to get on and pay people. Alan Bates told an inquiry he couldn't see an end to the scandal, which saw the prosecution of 900 sub-postmasters and mistresses due to a faulty horizon system. He told the committee the culture at the post office will never change. My personal view about post office is it's a dead duck and it has been for years and it's going to be a money pit for the taxpayer for years to come and you should sell it to someone like Amazon for a pound, get really good contracts for all the serving sub-postmasters and within a few years you'll have one of the best networks around. Well, Talk TV reporter Oliver whitfield Mircic asked the CEO Nick Reid his thoughts. Do you agree with Alan Bates that the post office should be sold to Amazon for a pound, that they'll do a much better job than what the post office is doing? Why is it taking so long to get compensation to the victims, the sub-postmasters? Joe Biden says he hopes a ceasefire can be achieved in Gaza by next Monday, which include plans to swap Israeli hostages for Palestinian prisoners. A deal has been sent to Hamas after talks in Paris between Israel, the United States, Egypt and Qatar. But the terror group says the American president's comments are premature and don't reflect the situation on the ground. The BBC has apologised to the family at the centre of the Hugh Edwards scandal over the way they handled their complaint. The BBC was accused of not responding quickly enough to the young person's family. It's alleged the newsreader paid a teenager thousands of pounds for sexually explicit photos. The review published today acknowledged the public broadcaster's failure to consider the potential wider significance of the complaints. The Prince of Wales has pulled out of attending his godfather's memorial service for personal reasons, according to Kensington Palace. Prince William was due to deliver a reading for the late King Constantine of Greece at Windsor Castle today, but cancelled an hour before it was due to start. Kensington Palace would not provide any more detail, but Talk TV's royal editor Sarah Hewson said it was a PR nightmare for them. Of course, there was a huge amount of attention in the latter years of the late Queen's life when she had to pull out of events because everyone was very mindful about what might this mean. And, and with the King and, and with Kate's illness, now we get this great scrutiny. And it's a PR nightmare, isn't it, for Kensington Palace? On the one hand, they're being told by their principals that they want to maintain their privacy. And on the other hand, we're all on the phone every day. What's going on? What's going on?
MPs have warned the police is under unsustainable pressure because of ongoing protests such as those sparked by the Israel-Gaza war. A new report urges the government to force organisers to give police more notice of demonstrations, especially if they continue at their current size and frequency. And the former home of music legend Freddie Mercury is up for sale. The Kensington home of the late Queen singer is on the market for £30 million, but no information has been released yet due to privacy concerns for the current owner. Freddie Mercury bought the Garden Lodge in 1980, living there until he died in 1991. That's the latest weather time now with Nazneen Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. More rain for today. Starting across northern and western parts of the UK this morning where it has been very windy and stays windy through this afternoon. But it does brighten up there as you can see in the earlier satellite and radar picture is starting to move its way further south and eastwards to northern England, Wales, parts of the Midlands. Getting light and patchy in nature as it does but still rather wet conditions. It will probably stay dry until after dark across East Anglia and the southeast but these areas becoming rather cloudy. Meanwhile across Scotland, Northern Ireland, later the north and west of England and Wales it will brighten up but there will be some showers mainly across the parts of the north and west of Scotland. Now overnight that rain band continues its way further south and eastwards and clears. Most of Britain will be dry and clear through the night. Again we see the return of mist and fog patches for parts of the Midlands and central southern England and then by dawn we'll see another band of rain this time heading in from the west across parts of Northern Ireland with brisk winds and through tomorrow that rain band will continue to move its way eastwards. The murky conditions may be quite slow to clear across parts of England and Wales through the morning as well but by around mid-morning most of it will go as that rain heads eastwards but the far east of England I think just about staying dry. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon. The BBC has apologised to the family at the centre of the Hugh Edwards scandal after allegations made about the TV presenter's behaviour only reached senior managers two months after they were put forward. The BBC admits the complaints were not escalated quickly enough and has now changed its processes. An independent report into the handling of the initial complaint found the case was not logged properly to allow bosses to follow up allegations. Joining me in the studio to discuss this and some of the other big dominating news stories of the day, Deputy Comment Editor at The Telegraph, Annabelle Denham, is with us. I find this extraordinary, Annabelle, that you might have thought that in, in BBC HQ, I know it's a, you know, you've been over there, I've been there, it's a busy old place, I get that, it's a big old system, but, you know, it's very well funded, they've got systems in place. Somebody calls up and says, I want to make a very serious allegation against arguably one of your most famous faces on the telly. And for some reason, it sat on a shelf for two months. Nothing happened. It's absolutely extraordinary, and it's not just a large organisation, a busy organisation, but it's an organisation which you would expect has got a pretty beefed-up HR department, which yep. should have processes in place to deal with precisely these sorts of issues. But I think, you know, it is a problem in large companies yeah, yeah. where whistleblowers do not have avenues through which they can raise often genuine, legitimate and very serious and concerning complaints. Yep. Now, this is just a double whammy of sorts for the BBC because, of course, it had the initial uh, controversy and now it's the way that it dealt with that controversy which is coming under <laughs> serious Which is interesting because often that is the case, isn't it? So often, you know, it's, it's the, you know, you often hear it was the denial that followed that was worse than the actual issue itself and with this it, it's it's that isn't it and, and, and also I, I just remembered earlier in the newsroom that they were having an internal investigation as well as I remember because I think Victoria Derbyshire had exposed some or talked about some members of staff that had issues around this very area I don't know what's happened to the results of that maybe that's mm. an internal issue maybe legally they don't have to tell us but certainly you know you might think that if somebody rang the newsroom or emailed anywhere at the BBC and said, look, I have a very serious allegation against Hugh Edwards, not Hugh Smith, the mm. bloke that works in the post room where you could imagine it got lost, but Hugh Edwards, 
it, somebody might have said, look, I think we might need to look into this, but somehow within whatever... Si no, they didn't have a system. I think that's the point. They didn't have a proper system. No, and you have to ask why such a, a massive uh, scandal has erupted for processes to be yeah. changed for, to prompt some kind of overhaul of the BBC's procedures. But you know, my, my concern is that in these large organisations, that particularly ones which were run by the government or quasi-public uh, sector organisations, there does seem to be this tendency for staff to close ranks as soon as there yeah. is any kind of external or indeed internal um, scrutiny that... that emerges, yeah. they seem very reluctant to actually address it head on. Correct. Cans are kicked down the road. And at the centre of all of this are people who you know, may have very legitimate grievances against the talent within an organisation. And also, we live in an... It's a, it's a little bit like, you know, how does any um, organisation ever get caught sending inappropriate WhatsApp messages? You'd think by now everyone would go, we're not falling for the old WhatsApp ruse. Nobody would do that anymore. But every week we read a different story, of whether it's the police or some other organisation, that have had inappropriate conversations or communications. And with this, you might think by now, we do live in an era where we are aware that some celebrities do bad things. We've had Me Too. We've had all manner of other people. Folk have gone to jail for, mm -hmm. for, for criminality and sometimes these kind of um, offences or these kind of um, situations. So... If this was 20 years ago, I could imagine somebody would have gone, nah, not, uh, not Hugh, no, well, it's, it's clearly a troublemaker. We're not in that place anymore. You know, we know that people in very respected positions can do very bad things. That's absolutely right. People in respected positions have been known to abuse those positions. It's Correct. precisely the position that they are in which enables this behaviour. And what we cannot have is a culture within these organisations yep. that allows those behaviours to continue past the point that complaints have been raised. Now, yep. you know, of course, I, this is damaging to the BBC. There should be serious questions asked once again, mm -hmm. not just about its internal processes, not just about about its management, but also about its relationship with the UK government, its relationship with the UK taxpayer, Correct. whether the licence fee is really sustainable in the modern age. Yep. And what frustrates me is that I very much doubt we are going to have those conversations, Ian. I think this will just be another scandal, another uh, controversy that the BBC yep. rides out, much in the same way that the NHS seems to. And within a few weeks, it'll all be forgotten. Yeah, and and you've probably got a director of human resources who's paid more than the prime minister to you know, specifically to deal with this kind of stuff. Nothing happens. We understand that Mr. Edwards is still on full pay and uh, sitting at home, ready to, I don't know, for this conclusion or something. And of course, um, it's not always with these kind of cases. And there's there's a few others going on around in the media at the moment. Uh, even if there's no police action that doesn't necessarily mean you haven't done something wrong. That's not the only bar for what is bad or bad behaviour. No, and I think, you know, at the moment we find ourselves as a society in a situation where the lines are so blurred. And yep. as you say, just because there isn't criminality, just because the police hasn't have to, haven't had to get involved, that isn't to say that people in a position of power have not abused that position, that younger members of staff yeah, yeah. perhaps have, been, have not been exploited. And... Again, you know, I'm very wary of introducing more regulations into the workplace that perhaps aren't necessary, particularly mm. when it comes Agreed. to subjective terms like bullying. Yep. However, we also kind of have a situation where people are afraid to go to work, where yep. people are perhaps uh, being exploited when they're at work, people who feel that they can't speak up. I think absolutely essential is to have proper channels through Correct. which whistleblowers can raise concerns, and those appear to have been lacking yep. in the BBC, as they have indeed in other organisations recently. So that's something that's worth addressing. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how the government responds to this and whether it feels that it's necessary to weigh in on the indeed. procedures at the BBC. Spot on. Let's move to this story, Annabel. Uh, victory for the Cumbrian town in the grips of a housing crisis. This was uh, the town of Millham in Cumbria, a very small, unassuming place, very nice part of the country, uh, where suddenly they realised eight homes were being sort of done up, and they thought, well, that's good. You know, it's, it's not going to solve the whole problem mm. of housing in this area, but it's a start, only to discover that actually it was to house illegal immigrants uh, while pending their case. <laughs> Um, nobody knew about this. We interviewed the mayor. She came on the show last week. 
no, she knew nothing about it, literally nothing about it. There's no communication from the government to the local authority to say, this is what we're doing. A private company, a sort of Serco sort of outfit or similar, mm -hmm. had gone in and, you know, were starting sprucing up these, these nice homes. And everyone thought, what's going on there? Uh, it turns out that's what it was being used for. But there was a bit of an uproar. And there's a U-turn now, and they will no longer be used. Will they be used for locals? We don't know, but... No, so I think it's as many as 2,000 people living in this small part of yeah. Cumbria who have got up in arms and Yeah, and there's only, I think there's only about 6,500 that live there, so that's a third of the population. But the government needs to be prepared. There is a palpable anger among many communities now about the government's handling of uh, asylum seekers, about its yeah. failure, perceived failure at least, to control our borders. We know that there are many tens of thousands of potential refugees who are waiting to have their applications reviewed. We know that it's extremely mm -hmm. costly for the government to put them up anywhere. Yeah. And hotels costing as much as £7 million a day. Sure. When the Suella Bravman was Home Secretary, she looked at possibly housing them in tents, but that led to uproar uh, by campaigners and activists yeah, and human like rights charities one, and so on and so forth. So, I mean, to some extent, I do have sympathy with the government for the position in which it finds itself, because there are so many legal obstacles to it yeah. properly addressing this. However, what this particular case speaks to is the cost of immigration, and that isn't just the sums which have to go towards housing uh, asylum seekers, yeah. but also the pressure that they are now putting on public services. There was a Spot really on. interesting report from the IFS which came out today, it's pre-budget report, and that was, you know, essentially saying that taxpayers are going to, you know, the tax burden is going to have to go up significantly in order to meet the additional pressures that are placed on infrastructure and public services by high levels of net migration. Indeed. And meanwhile, uh, today we passed the 2,000 mark of people crossing the channel in small boats this year alone. There was nearly 300 on Sunday alone. Mm -hmm. And that's before the weather's got good. So it's not looking good for the Stop the Boats campaign over there at Rishi HQ, is it really? No, it's not at all. I think it's going to be yet another humiliation for yeah. a Conservative government which has failed to deliver on the pledges that were set out over a year ago Very now. Clear and pledges. I think it, you know, it's going to raise questions over why Rishi Sunak lost yeah. his bottle in calling an early election this year. What was he hoping was going to improve? Because certainly when it came to the Stop the Boats pledge, it was quite clear that the numbers were going to increase, Correct. and increase significantly, particularly over the summer, if they were looking to an autumn election. That will be the backdrop against which yeah. they go into it. Um, and what I don't understand about this, Labour, all the polling says that Labour are more trusted on immigration than the Conservatives. I don't know who these people are that tick that particular box, because there's nothing in the Labour DNA, there's nothing in Keir Starmer's backstory that would suggest he's going to be you know, more forthright on this particular issue. In fact, all the evidence would suggest the very opposite. No, that's right. I think when Labour have been all too ready to criticise Tory policy, government policy, yep. when it comes to immigration or asylum seekers, it's been quite clear they don't have very many answers of their own. However, I think that a big problem facing the Conservatives is the betrayal. It's the fact that in Direct. successive manifestos, they promised yep. to bring down net migration. Cameron May into, down into the tens of thousands, promising, Rishi Sunak promising to stop the boats. And people are seeing increasing numbers of people coming here. There's been a failure of integration. There's been a failure to properly invest in public services and improve efficiency in the public sector. And that might be why the yeah. Tories are not trusted. It's not necessarily that people believe immigration will come down under Labour. It's that the poor Tories have made all these pledges, they've made all these promises, Correct. and they've broken them. Yeah, every one of them, it seems. Um, and a final one here, Annabelle. Uh, Prince, this is a little bit concerning, really. Prince William pulling out of a service due to a personal matter. Obviously, there's a lot going on in the royal household at mm. the moment. His father's not well, his wife's not well, she's recovering. Prince Charles still receiving treatment, uh, but he pulled out of a church service due to what was simply quoted as a personal matter. Um, we don't know the specifics of it, but naturally there's a lot of people concerned as to what might have happened here. Yes, that's right. I mean, it could be anything as simple as Prince William having a sore throat and not feeling up to it. However, a significant yeah. event in his life, a memorial service for his godfather. The fact that he hasn't explained his absence will lead to a lot of intrigue, questions over uh, what's really going on in the royal family. Um, 
again, the context for this is that when King Charles assumed the throne, he wanted yeah. to have a more streamlined monarchy. Uh, he wanted to ensure that the British public felt as though they were getting value mm -hmm. for money. And that was actually a decision I was wholeheartedly supportive of. Yeah. However, now that he has had this very sad diagnosis, um, uh, the Princess of Wales has been in hospital. She is now at home recovering. There are very few royals who are able to go out and fulfil some of their we, we've obligations run out of and royals. engagements. We've they run out of royals and we've run out of time. <laughs> um, Annabel, good to see you again. Annabel Thank Denham you. with us here on Talk TV. And coming up after the break, the Home Office U-turns on the migrant homes after a local protest in Cumbria. We'll look at that in more detail. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, uh, know it's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> there are no banners calling for the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no the banners, mass. Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march. Not, when no, can't say them on the mass. Sorry, no. I, I'm sorry, I've, got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you no, can't. It's good. I'm, no, so, it's I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth is going on in the House of Commons? I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. Right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Rishi Sunak actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special guy. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> My your mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and of course, your smart speaker. Now, last week, we spoke to the mayor of Millam, the Cumbrian town in the middle of a housing crisis. But it looked as if a solution was on the horizon. A property development company in the town had decided to convert eight rundown properties into lovely new homes. A success story, surely. Well, not exactly. It transpired that those homes were not for the Cumbrian families, desperate for an affordable place to live in their hometown. In fact, the Home Office had decided in its wisdom that the, this scheduled co secluded corner of rural England was the perfect place to house 40 or so illegal migrants. It also turned out that Millam's mayor, Simone Faulkner, was the last to know. We haven't been officially told. We, we've found out by... Um, uh, residents asking the developers uh, 
when they were working on the properties, what were they doing? And that's how they found out wow. that they were destined for HMO. So as a council, and it's a small council, we we did some investigating, some research. If we are guinea pigs, then I, I think we should have been consulted first and foremost. Yeah, People I should have come and had a look at our infrastructure to see if it was appropriate. Well, today I'm pleased to say there is some good news. It's a win for Common Sense, a win for Millam, and a bit of a win for Talk TV. The Home Office has paused its plans after local protests. Almost 2,000 people joined in action group and public meetings were packed to the rafters as locals banded together to demand that the plans were scrapped. Local services are already stretched to breaking point and without significant investment, it would not have been possible for the area to support these new residents. So what happens to the houses now? Perhaps they could be developed into council properties. Just a thought, but I won't hold my breath. Meanwhile, we learnt today that more than 2,000 channel migrants have arrived illegally so far this year in 2024. Home office figures show 290 people arrived on Sunday alone. Despite winter weather, the boats keep coming. We can only imagine how many more will make that crossing over the spring and summer. Rishi Sunak's promise to stop the boats is literally in tatters. The Prime Minister is clearly living on a different planet. He said yesterday, I'm confident that we really will be able to stop the boats and that will mean we won't have this pressure on all our local areas to find places to house illegal migrants. Well, maybe the Rwanda plan could work if those flights ever get off the ground. But what are we supposed to do whilst we wait for the lords and the lawyers to decide if it's even allowed? Patience is wearing very thin, especially as Sunak seems determined to purge his party of those political figures who actually have the backbone to say what's really happening. And to add to Sunak's misery today, David Neal, the former Independent Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration, fired by the Home Office, is giving evidence to a select committee. Now, Neil has already said that Border Force didn't check passengers on hundreds of private jets arriving into London. This allowed criminals, illegal immigrants, trafficking victims and extremists to enter the UK without undergoing any kind of scrutiny by the authorities. So remember that next time you're in a two-hour immigration queue on your way home from Alicante with the kids in tow. If only you'd gone private. You'd be home by now on the sofa with a giant Toblerone, 200 cigs and whatever else you fancied smuggling back. It is a joke. Joining me live, Henry Bolton, OBE, international border control expert, to discuss this and more afternoon to you, Henry. I mean, I say what a joke, afternoon, but it does feel as if someone's having a bit of a joke here. Um, we keep hearing Rishi Sunak. Every time the figures get worse and worse, more people coming across, 2,000 this year, what was going on in Milham is really just one microcosm of what's happening in many, many parts of the UK. Take people out of hotels, it's costing 7 million quid a day. Uh, well, we'll just put them in houses, it costs 6.9 million quid a day. I mean, none of this is being solved. It's a mess. It, it is a mess, Ian. And, you know, people are losing patience. Um, then you get somebody like Lee Anderson who starts to sort of raise concerns and they're immediately labelled. Look... You know, the people of this country, most people, I believe it's most people anyway, are tired of a prime minister and a party, in fact, political leaders, who keep saying that they're going to do something and then utterly fail to do it. And in the chaos that ensues, in this particular case, uh, with immigration, we have... Uh, not it's it's not just this case in Cumbria, but it's all across the country. We see hotels taken up, we see local housing taken up, we see uh, barges being used. It is an incoherent, inconsistent, and badly uh, thought through and implemented plan. Um, it's not. I hesitate because it's not a plan. Yeah. You know, you just mentioned the uh, the independent inspector of borders who's just been sacked for as you quite rightly say, uh, highlighting that uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of flights into the UK have not been checked. I was saying this three years ago. I was trying to raise the alarm on this. It's also private boats. We're very, uh, we're very good at interdicting and then escorting back to the UK, the, the dinghies. But there are a myriad of smaller vessels, privately owned vessels, that are coming into the UK in small ports every day. 
There was a time when the harbour masters and port masters were responsible for checking those. Part of the, the border uh, sort of infrastructure and, and, and systems that we had. But that's long since gone, since political parties and governments felt that, you know, the, the ports should be purely, uh, purely commercial. Well, you know, the ho what's really frustrating, Ian, for me, and I think most of the country, is the, the sheer inability to do anything properly. Now, is that our parliamentarians? Is it the civil service? Well, I don't know. And until somebody actually develops a plan, then we're not going to know. That's yeah. the missing piece here, Ian. There is no plan. And there is, there is just a, a, a prime minister saying, well, you know, here's my nine point plan, my five point, my five promises. That's it. Yeah. There is no planning. I it's would have thought by now Rishi Sunak might be a bit embarrassed, Henry, to even utter the phrase, we are going to stop the boats. I'm convinced we can stop the boats. I know we can stop the boats. Uh, quite aside from the demonstrable evidence that he is not stopping the boats and they continue in very large numbers, 2,000 mm -hmm. this year alone, and we're only about seven weeks in to 2024. It's not looking good, and that's before the good weather properly kicks in as well. An extraordinary yeah. situation where most polling suggests that Labour are more trusted on immigration. I don't know what people are thinking of when they f answer uh, affirmative to that question. Um, just remind us, Henry, we've been over this story many times over the years, what, how do we, literally, how do we stop the boats? Well, uh, <laughs> I'm going to say two things here, Ian. One is that if you don't have a strategic framework, then a policy framework clearly defined, then you are not going to be able to pull together uh, your diplomatic effort with your intelligence effort, with your policing effort, with your legal efforts, with your operational effort on the borders itself. Um, none of these things are going to have any coherence. Um, we need to, that's the first thing, bring that framework. I say first, but concurrently to that, there are a range of different things we could do. So, for example, if we want to actually physically stop the boats on the maritime border, um, and I think that we can actually drastically reduce the numbers before they even get to the North French coast, but that's part of this overall framework. If we want the operational answer, and I know many people want to know this, look, the military, uh, special specialist forces, not necessarily just special forces, but uh, use quite often drive ribs, rigid and hold, but inflatable sort of, uh, around it, it's a bit like a, a dinghy, drive them into the belly of a landing craft. Well, there are ways of incapacitating the outboard motors on the dinghies that are crossing the channel at the moment, quite easily, very safely. If you disable that outboard motor, then it's not got manoeuvre. Therefore, it can't evade, and therefore you're not in a struggle with it. You lower the ramp of a landing craft, can only be done in good, reasonably good weather, which is when they cross, and drive the landing craft in to scoop them up into the belly of the landing craft. Now, if you then drive that landing craft to the French coast, you could do it with or without agreement, to be quite honest. I I'd be tempted, if the French don't want to agree, then to call their bluff and say, look, these people came from your country. You're part, of part of France's international obligations on borders, there's something called the OSC border security and management concept, is to prevent people leaving their country if they don't have the correct documentation to enter the country they're going to. In this case, that's all of these people in dinghies. So drive them back to the French coast. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the pan. And in that sense, Lee Anderson's right. And we've got to call it out for what it is. We've got a government, a political class, that is simply failing because they don't have the courage, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the experience, and they probably shouldn't be in the job in the first place. There it is. Henry Thorough Stuff as ever. Thank you, Henry Bolton, with us here on Talk TV. We'll come back to some of your comments in a few moments. We're asking the question, do you have any faith left in the government's immigration policy? 0344 499 1,000. We'll come back to that story. Moving on, though, to the latest from Kensington Palace. Prince William has pulled out of a memorial service due to personal matters, according to the palace. He had been due to deliver a reading and a ceremony to honour his godfather, the late King Constantine of Greece. Queen Camilla led members of the royal family at the service in his place. Kensington Palace did not elaborate further, but said that Kate, the Princess of Wales, is doing well as she continues to recover from abdominal surgery.
Secretary. Joining us now in the studio, Talk TV's Royal Editor Sarah Houston is with us. I mean, naturally, speculation is rife at something like this. He's pulled out. He might just have a tummy bug. Uh, maybe they would have said that. I don't know. Is this to do with the king? Because he's obviously having cancer treatment. Is it to do with his wife, who's in recovery after severe surgery? Well, on those latter two points, I don't think it's to do with either, actually, because let's look at what we do know. Kensington Palace saying that the Princess of Wales continues to be doing well. Yep. So I think that remark is trying to distance this particular event from anything to do with Kate's health. Uh, and the King, well, he was at Windsor Castle earlier on today. He left before uh, this service of Thanksgiving for King Constantine, his second cousin, a close friend of his. But we knew that he wasn't going to be in attendance mm. because he's not going to big gatherings sure. at the moment, given the treatment he's undergoing. Uh, he then returned to Clarence House, but Queen Camilla was representing so if him. There was so anything, if there was anything awful going yes. on with the King, she wouldn't be there Yes, either, so. and she was representing him. I think the mood music is this isn't anything to be overly concerned about. But of course, the moment you hear that Prince William has had to pull out at the last minute, mm. it is going to ring some alarm bells. And there's an, a lot of extra scrutiny on their movements, the engagements they do, the, what that might mean yeah. if they have to pull out. These things do happen. Although I'd say do it's usually happen? pretty serious if they're going to pull out of something say, like this. You, yeah. To pull out for personal reasons. When, you know, you listen to... Uh, uh, I don't think William has been so vocal about this for obvious reasons, but Prince Harry, whatever you think of Prince Harry, you know, he's talk he talked very openly about, you know, how he and his brother would sort of sit there waiting for the police motorcycles to turn up because they knew they had an engagement, an opening, something to attend. And he said that, you know, if you were having a terrible time, as he was at that time with all sorts of mm. issues, um, there, was, put a brave there face was nothing on worse. It. You had to put a brave face on mm. it. Um, there was no real pulling out of it, was sort of the suggestion. So, no, because they know they're letting so many people down yes, if they do. And this was a big deal today. This is uh, the memorial service for Prince William's godfather, King Constantine of Greece, the last king of Greece, uh, first cousin once removed to Prince Philip, his sailing partner, yep. second cousin of the king, very close uh, friend of the king, so much so that he chose him to be one of William's uh, godfathers. Very close family ties between mm -hmm. the two families. And so we've seen a big turnout from members of the royal family today, but not William. And not only was he due to attend, he was due to be giving a reading. Uh, Crown Prince Pavlos uh, of Greece, King Constantine's son, stepped in to do that. But that meant William was on the order of service. Yes. It was it was, so this was very confirmed last minute that start. he was due to go. And, and Kensington Palace saying it was a personal matter, not elaborating uh, any further. Uh, but that reassuring news yeah. that the, the Princess of Wales continues so to So that wouldn't well. just be a sore throat, as somebody said earlier, because you could always say, you know, OK, I can't give the speech because I've lost my voice. Uh, it would suggest there's something more going on. I mean, I don't want to employ hyperbole yeah. here when there is no evidence, but as you say, it's quite rare for this to happen, particularly at an event such as this that he feels strongly about. It, does it was happen. clearly last minute. Yeah. Otherwise, his name wouldn't be on the order of service. Yeah. And I People think, will speculate. And I think probably they'd be hoping that we wouldn't notice, but of course, Maybe. That extra scrutiny uh, on uh, the royals at the moment means yeah. that, you know, if William's not just going up the road, because it's not a far... It's not a long trip for him either from Adelaide Cottage to St George's Chapel this is in true. Windsor. Uh, and so it would suggest that something yes. had happened that yeah, was yeah, a bit yeah. more serious. I mean, it, it could be to do with one of the children, for example, and in which case you would understand why of they course. Want to, uh, yeah. don't want to go into any details of it. It could be that he was ill and, and they don't want to, you know, say to Do we ever get it. to know? I mean, is there a... I mean, you know the, the, how the palace functions very well, Sarah, more than most, and how that machine operates. Um, and it's been appalling over the years. I mean, it's, it seems to have got a little bit more efficient. Do we hear more? Is there another press release? Will we get one tomorrow saying no. William's fine? Because doubtless he's got other engagements this week. I, I, I imagine they'll hope this one just blows over yeah. and um, that, you know, they've, they've said it's not anything... You know, they've, sure. they've sort of insinuated this is not a big area of concern. But he must be due moment. elsewhere in the next few days. Yeah, and then we'll see him in public again. And and that's the thing, he has, you know, only recently come back uh, yeah, yeah. to uh, working life, uh, having taken some time out. And, and what was interesting today is 
when William wasn't there, Queen Camilla was leading the royal family, but she was driven uh, from Windsor Castle to St George's Chapel. And that meant we had the spectre of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson leading the royal party down the hill to St George's Chapel. Now, this wasn't an official uh, engagement True. for the royal family. It was a family engagement. And we understand that the, the Duke of York was invited as a member of the British royal family by the Greek uh, royal right. family. But quite incredible to see uh, those images of him at the, the front of the pack, uh, if you like. Yeah. It's always good to see Mike Tyndall out and about, though, isn't it? Mike, Zara there. They bring some brevity Dan. and some normality <laughs> to that yeah, family. Yeah, absolutely. Just waiting no for nonsense. a bit of a rugby tackle on the, uh, on the prince <laughs> Hopefully the front not there. splitting his trousers on this occasion, well, as in, he uh, indeed. Uh, has described it. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> Sarah, thank you. Sarah Hewson, our royal editor with us on the programme. Now, coming up, the cost of policing pro-Palestine marches has soared to more than 25 million pounds placing an unsustainable burden on officers according to mps we'll talk about next that next on talk tv i'm ian collins you're with talk on tv radio online and of course on that smart speaker hey very good morning to you thanks for joining us you're with talk tv on tv on radio online and we're on your smart speaking Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent, that's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You know? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. Ooh, whoa, is it? There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> There are no banners calling for and the release of the condemn, hostages. They will not there condemn are no Hamas. banners, Kevin. You can't say everyone on that march when we can't say Hamas. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, I've got, I've got you both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't. Good. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? What on earth? is going on in the House of Commons. I'll try my very best to explain that, Daisy, but it is an extremely complicated situation. This just absolutely stinks. All right, Neil Parrish, he was great for his area. If Richard Soon actually brought him out today and said, this guy's going to be advised by a special right. If anybody can pull it off, it'll be him. Oh, <laughs> what? Oh. What? <laughs> my your mind. mind. <laughs> it's not our mind, it's your mouth, Mr. Unbelievable. Collins. Unbelievable. Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, Radio, Online, and your smart speaker. Now, the BBC has admitted it did not escalate a complaint made about Hugh Edwards' behaviour quickly enough. The broadcaster has now issued an apology to the family of a young person who made the complaint about the BBC News presenter back in May 2023. The allegations against him were not communicated to senior BBC managers until July. The corporation says... 
It's since changed its complaint handling process. It comes after an independent report into the handling of the initial complaint made against Hugh Edwards found the case was not logged properly to allow bosses to follow up allegations. Joining me now is the media law consultant Ian Bloom. Ian, good afternoon to you. I mean, every now and again a story comes along, um, you scratch your head a bit and think, hang on, it's 2023, how the heck could this happen? Well, you'll remember last summer we had the Philip Schofield scandal, the Hugh Edwards one and the Russell Brand one. They came in quick, fairly quick succession. And in Hugh Edwards' case, what happened was that a family uh, member went to the BBC complaints department and for seven weeks heard nothing, uh, got nowhere, and they... Um, decided that they were being ignored and they thought, how do we best get the BBC's attention? And we know we'll go to The Sun. And The Sun newspaper published a massive front page splash, which did get the BBC's attention and it got everyone else's as well. Mm. And for five or six days, there was intense speculation about this story of a high profile presenter who had apparently um paid a significant sum of money for sexually explicit photos and the question was who was it who was it who was it and after about five or six days um these things happened in quick succession first the met had investigated and said no evidence of criminal behavior secondly hugh edwards wife Vic, um, vicky flind came along and said look it's hugh edwards let's stop the speculation I'm outing him, in a way, to protect his mental health and also our, our children. And thirdly, um, that having happened, no criminality and a man suffering, the focus then kind of switched to to what extent it is, is the private life of a public person. Um, something that should be aired in public in the way it was, and to what extent does it curtail the freedom of the press? Now, this debate is endless. It goes on all the time. Yeah. And what was fairly obvious at the time, and is now been confirmed today, is that the BBC had had a massive internal problem with communication. You could say, you could say, that a big company has an HR or PR or investigation uh, department that has failed. Well, of course it fails. Um, things happen. But when it fails with such a high profile person, then questions like this are asked, investigations are called. Tim Davey, the BBC Director General, was questioned in the House of Commons. And at the end of an investigation lasting seven months, it could have taken about seven minutes, they realised that their procedures were inadequate and and should have um, should, this should never have happened. And today, finally, they've said to the family, we apologise. Thank you. Does it does it not just just a final point, Ian? Does it not? I mean, that 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 is you, you've outlined you know, completely accurately what clearly happened. But the fact that it happened, the fact that a, a, a very high-profile face, one of the highest-paid uh, members of the team over there at the BBC, a, and also, a, you know, the trusted face of royal events and current affairs, etc., was being accused of paying for explicit photographs from a teenager. You might have thought that that would have been flagged right to the top of the poll within about half a nanosecond. Two months... That, I mean, that's well, not just a broken system. That's a, the, the, the suggestion there would be there is no system, or there was. I, I, Ian, I completely agree with you. I, I, I did some interviews at the time and, and more or less said that. It, it's inconceivable that one of the top broadcasters, I suppose, in this country has accusations made against him that are, on the face of it, extremely serious. Yeah. And nothing happens for seven weeks until a newspaper is told the story and immediately prints it. It is worth saying, Ian, that the individual at the centre, the young person, denied this, this story at the outset. And that denial was not published by the Sun, sadly. 
Um, it's also worth repeating, no criminality, mistake of judgment or whatever. Hugh Edwards has never appeared on screen. He is still um, off limits in terms of his health for any investigation to take place. So the story hasn't finished, yep. but you're right to say there's been a systemic failure at the BBC to deal with a, a, a very senior member of, of their staff. Indeed. Ian, listen, um, we are short on time, but thank you, sir, for your time. Appreciate it. Ian Bloom with us here on Talk TV, the media law consultant. Now, from the BBC to the Met Police now, MPs have warned that pro-Palestine marches are placing an unsustainable burden on the police as it's revealed the cost of policing these demonstrations has soared to over £25 million. Ministers say the protests over Israel's military response to Hamas on October the 7th terror attacks are inhibiting officers from being able to fight crime. Demonstrations in the capital have resulted in more than 26,000 extra shifts for Met Police officers so far. Joining me in the studio, Met Police, former Met Police detective Peter Blexley is with us. Always gauge, good to gauge your views on this. Um, we, I mean, these are beyond telephone number figures, Peter. £25 million. No one has got 25 million quid down the back of the sofa, let alone the Met Police. Yes, and not only flag, ministers flagging this up, the Home Office Affairs Committee published a report which came out only today. Yep. And they've alluded to that. In fact, they've suggested that perhaps in an effort to drive down these costs, there might be a new law brought in, which means that protesters have to give greater notice uh, to the Metropolitan Police before they're going to protest, because it really does have an impact. You see, police officers, if they have a rest day cancelled mm. with less than five days' notice, and they then work that day, they get paid double bubble, double right. money. So you can see how quickly... So you pay for the shift and the inconvenience of the cancelled shift. Exactly. Yeah. They're being compensated for having their yeah. rest day cancelled. So they go to work. Many officers are very keen to do that. And imagine if an officer, which they will often do on public order policing, will do a 12 or 14 hour shift. Yeah. Suddenly you're getting three days pay for one long day at work. Yeah. And police officers are very keen to do that, sure. to get the overtime. Then, if we throw into the mix many officers being brought in for these demonstrations from different police services, the length and breadth of the country, not only are there transport costs, but there's accommodation costs. Try finding a cheap hotel in London. Good luck with that one. Yep. And so the costs build up very, very quickly and become as huge as they are. It's very difficult, isn't it? Because, you know, we live in a country where we are pro-freedom of speech and pro-protest, even if we don't like the cut of someone's jib. That doesn't matter. It's the right to free speech. I mean, clearly, I think, and I think lots of other people would agree, there's some elements of this protest have crossed some pretty unsavoury lines. We could talk about that another time. But what is the answer, then, with something like this? Because the difficulty is these protests are happening a lot. And if they're happening on a weekly basis, is there a, a point when the police could stop the protests from taking place? Or does that create even more of a problem? That creates potentially an even bigger problem could, that, could be a riot, that, that yeah. you started with. And I think a lot of the timidity around the policing of these protests in yep. recent weeks and months has been because the police are petrified of creating large-scale disorder. Yep. My own personal view is that they are actually, I think in the process, unfortunately, of creating what they've tried to avert. And what I mean by that is this kind of softly, softly approach in yep. many regards, which was alluded to in this report from the Home Affairs Committee today. Mm -hmm. They said policing's got to be done without fear or favour. Yep. They also said that policing of protest should be the same, whether it's 20 protesters or 20,000 protesters. Yep. Senior public order police officers will say that shows the, the naivety of the Home Affairs Committee, but that's a, a different argument. Sure. I think by being timid in certain circumstances, what they've allowed is this expression of two-tier policing to creep in. Correct. And you see it everywhere on social media, yeah. particularly amongst people who are deeply dissatisfied and it is stoking the fires of discontent. A absolutely right, which I think is the point that many people were arguing Lee Anderson was trying to get to when he made his comments, even though 
Lee Anderson did make a comment that actually wasn't true and that probably lost him some house points in some quarters, but not all. Um, I think we can all agree, you know, if I, if I stood on Tower Bridge, Peter, with a bunch of flares in my back pocket and started letting them off, I reckon it would be about three and a half minutes before I was nicked for that. I'm not allowed to do it. If I then got, you know, a couple of hundred of my mates to do the same thing and close that bridge, I think they would be arrested as well. On Saturday night, we saw that happen. It looked like Tehran High Street. I have no idea what happened to, you know, uh, the response that you would expect to something like that. Nobody was arrested. Apparently, no laws were broken. Yeah, well, that's utter nonsense, of course, because there was obstruction of the highway, a very basic, simple law, True. easy to prove, yep. easy to prosecute. So that is complete and utter nonsense. Three weeks ago, the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, spoke about bringing in more legislation relating to flares, fireworks and the such like, yep. but clearly that's not on the statute book yet. But any senior police officer of any persuasion that turns around and tells you that no, no laws were broken perfectly exhibits the fluffy, wokey and, quite frankly, dishonest mindset that unfortunately pollutes some senior policing. Yeah, and there is that sense, and I think you hit the nail on the head, Peter, perhaps the senior command are thinking, right, we don't want to cause a riot, and we know that the, by nature of this particular area, if we start nabbing people left, right and centre on the spot, we would do, rather do it retrospectively, so they've looked at social media images and then they've nabbed a few people after that. But, you know, many would say, well, that's just unacceptable. You know, if, you know, if the EDL had gone into Trafalgar Square with racist chants, they would be nicked. So why would pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel protesters, as most of them are, why would they not be nabbed for the same offence? Well, let's rewind only to November, to Remembrance Weekend of yep. last year, when a couple of hundred or so of people that are rather lazily called far-right turned up because they were going to protect the cenotaph, yep. as they said. They were suddenly kettled by police officers in their boiler suits, with their peak caps on, with their batons drawn. And very many of them were handcuffed. That is very inconsistent with what we see, for example, with the policing that happened on Saturday. Yeah. But I've got no qualms in repeating what I think is going to happen. The police, in their wokerati central efforts to kind of prevent widespread disorder, yeah. are actually going to create on a far greater scale what they've been trying to prevent from happening. Who is running this? I mean, there's the Prime Minister says this is unacceptable. You know, the Home Secretary will say this is unacceptable. Uh, Matey over there at the Met Police will probably say, you know, a lot of this is unacceptable, but no crime's taken place. People are displaying anti-Semitic tropes on the side of the Houses of Parliament on Big Ben. The other day, you've got all manner of other things going on, particularly the anti-Jewish thing, a, you know, a crowd heckled out of a theatre. And nothing is happening. We seem to have, in 10 seconds, if we can, Peter, somebody has lost the backbone or the, 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 their way on this, and I would point it firmly to begin with at number 10. Well, ultimately, in policing terms, the responsibility rests with Sir Mark Rowley, the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. They have individual commanders that are in charge of uh, public order events, but yep. the buck stops with him. There it is. Um, it's always good. Thorough stuff, Peter. Thank you. Good to see you. Peter Blexley with us here on Talk TV. We've come to the end of the show. Thank you for tuning in. We are, of course, back at the same time tomorrow. Make sure you're there, 3 p.m., Monday to Friday. I'm back at 6 p.m. on the Talk. Vanessa Feltz is next. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Oh, it's, bless him, he's soaking wet. Nice. The most likely situation is that that statue is going to end up in M Shed, which is a museum just on the harbour. Nick, I, when we first went to you, I thought you dived into the harbour to get the, get the thing out, for God's sake, man. Well done, good job. Islamism is sweeping our nation. This is not Islamophobia, this is real. Another terror attack, another killing of an MP. Oh, don't worry, let's light a candle, let's all sing, let's look, don't look back in anger and sing Kumbaya. He had a, a politically uh, minded project called WikiLeaks, which said yeah. nothing about what was going on in the Kremlin, nothing about what was going on in China. There was a clear political bias in what he was doing. This is the first time Millam has heard of asylum seekers coming to the town. If we are guinea pigs, then I think we should have been consulted.
this concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. Well, it will be a problem if they start breaking into people's homes because they can break into yours and decide that you're not doing enough. <laughs> they can break into mine and decide I'm not doing enough. And I'll tell you what, if they break into my home, it will get violent. That's for sure. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? You know?